everybody, this is going to be a snippet that is going to be included later this week when I finish the rest of the materials for the next episode of Ineptus Astartes, but I just thought I would cut this out and show it now for anybody who is interested on day one of this new Demon Engine release. As always, please consider liking, subscribing, check out the link to buy me a coffee or buy Hazel a dog treat below, and uh, hope you enjoy. Oh my gosh, people, we finally have Demon Rules. Never mind, it's Demon Engine Rules. Reset the clock! All right, I just got done mowing the lawn and I ran downstairs. It is, it's one o'clock on the 15th. This PDF has been out for about four hours. Um, let's go through it. Hottest of hot takes incoming. So first of all, the Corrupted Engine Supplement um, is intended to be used for a Mechanicum army. However, they, you can also use it. You can get special access to one of these such units if you have a Legion Prabian in a Space Marines army. So, of course, you must be Traitor, but let's start with the Legion Prabian and Corrupted Engines rules. So, the Legion Prabian, which is a console upgrade that I have covered before, which uh, I guess my video is now outdated, but the special thing about the Prabian before was your ability to take one unit of Mechanicum Automata. Specifically, that would be the Castlox or the Vorax Battle Automata. Instead, what you can do is pick one unit with the Corrupted Engine subtype. It does not form the same Force Organization spot as the Pravian. It must be bought with its Force Org position. The unit does gain the Legionus Astartes X special rule that the Pravian has, but it cannot be given any war gear or any additional options. The rule specifically says that if you bring one Pravian or if you bring three, you can still only bring in one such corrupted engine unit no matter what. So no way to game around that. So one of these can be taken for a Space Marine list if you are going to uh, do so. Uh, however, for the rest, a Mechanicum, standard Mechanicum, this is just a way to finally get some Dark Mechanicum style units. So we have the Corrupted Engine subtype, and we need to pay attention to these rules. So all models with the Corrupted Engine subtype gain Fear 1, or if it already has Fear, then it increases by 1 instead. Any rule effect that would affect a model with Corrupted Unit subtype also affects a Corrupted Engine Unit subtype. So for example, the Anathema subtype special rules, or the Inexorable special rule. Any unit composed entirely of models with the Corrupted Engine subtype is immune to the effects of fear, automatically passes regroup checks, cannot fail a morale check due to our weapons are useless. In addition to that, a Corrupted Engine, when it does uh, fail a morale check, doesn't fall back, but it follows the standard demon rule of suffering D3 automatic wounds with no saves or damage mitigations allowed at all. Any hits inflicted on a model with the Corrupted Engine Unit subtype with the Force or Psychic Focus special rule gains instant death, which is cool. In addition to that, however, all Corrupted Engines natively get protection against instant death, equal to what the standard Dreadnought gets with its Automatic Deflector, which means that if it's struck by something with instant death, it instead of dying loses D3 wounds. No model that does not also have Corrupted Engine subtype may join a unit that, does, that doesn't. So basically, these guys are stuck on their own, provided that there's not some future idea later that allows them to be joined by something else. But they cannot. They're on their own. So, as stated, this is a rule set that is actually primarily designed for the Mechanicum. And so there is a new Arcana, Cybersurgic Arcana, that is available to these armies. So Anima Malefica is, I guess, the default Dark Mechanicum power so far. It has two powers. The first one is the Animatus Malevolence, and the second is the Amthea Excrucius. As with the standard from the other from Mechanicum before, basically one, one of the powers is going to be some sort of buff or effect, and the other one is going to be a weapon. Animatus Malevolence is the buff, and it allows you to forego a shooting attack to target a single friendly unit within 12 inches that is entirely composed of models with the Corrupted Engine subtype. Then you can apply one of the following effects. That unit can immediately move a number of inches up to its unmodified initiative characteristic directly towards the nearest unit. All models in the unit improve their invulnerable save by 1 to a maximum of 3+, plus until the start of that controlling player's next turn or all models in the unit add one to their weapon skill and initiative characteristic until the end of the subsequent assault phase. 
So the way this works is the player can choose to just make this go off and you can get one of those. However, you can do a cyberthergy check, um, very similar to the way you would do a leadership test for a uh, psychic power. And if successful, then you can have two of them. If the check has failed, then you get nothing and you suffer a cyberthergic feedback. The weapon is really interesting. The Amthea Crucius is range 18, strength 5, AP 3, assault 3, blind, deflagrate, and then the cyberthergic focus, which it says that you have to make the cyberthergy check before you can use the power. If it's passed, then it works, and if it doesn't, then you suffer feedback and you don't get to shoot the ability. Strength 5, AP 3, assault 3 with deflagrate means that you are pretty likely to cause remove a couple of to cause a couple of wounds to three plus save models the deflagrate and strength five you're more like you're pretty likely to roll an additional one so with a, a presuming a model with ballistic skill five hitting on twos you're pretty likely to cause i would say three removals um, you could sort of expect something around that uh, in addition to that the blind check is something that's fun if it's you know not necessarily super likely to happen but the ability to apply it and cause somebody to check pretty great as well i'd rate both of these powers pretty highly especially the animatus malevolence because increasing an invulnerable save and then adding one to weapon skill and initiative so swinging faster swinging better and having a better save that's pretty great there is overlap here as well and this is something that's really interesting in addition is that we are still talking about etheric dominions, which are basically the classifications that demons get to use. And two of those have been brought over from the Bound Demon PDF that came out about five months ago. The first is Heedless Slaughter, and the second is the Malevolent Artifice. In this book, Malevolent Artifice reads, Models with this special rule may reroll all failed armor saves taken against wounds resolved at a strength value lower than their toughness characteristic, this special rule has no effect on cover saves or invulnerable saves. Now, this is the exact same wording as the Bound Demons PDF, and so nothing to, nothing to remark there. It's a really fantastic power, and if you go back and listen to the episode of my podcast where I talked about this when it first came out, which I have linked below, you will note that I rated this one pretty highly. I thought people would use this one pretty consistently. Demons, the Bound Demons in that book, had a base toughness of 5, which means that against most or all small arms, you're basically getting a chance to reroll regular armor saves, which is just fantastic. What's interesting here is the fact that Heedless Slaughter is different in this PDF than it is in the uh, Bound Demons PDF. In the PDF released today, a Heedless Slaughter says that a unit composed entirely of models with a special rule has to declare a charge of able when they begin the assault phase within eight inches of an enemy unit. If there is more than one eligible target, the controlling player may choose which of the charges to make so long as they're within eight. And it specifically says this doesn't negate the standard shooting requirements with, that go along with charges, aka if you shot one unit, that is the unit that you have to charge. So still there is a way to try to shoot something that's farther than eight inches uh, away, you know, basically make it so that you can't charge something that's closer. So there's the way to game around that. The next paragraph, though, is the one that's changed. Additionally, a unit composed of any models with this special rule gains a plus one value to any charge rolls and a plus one to the score used to determine if they win a combat in the assault phase and a plus one value for any roll to determine the result of a sweeping advance. Now, in the... I was pretty harsh on this Etheric Dominion before because uh, it did not have that plus one to charge before. There was a requirement of charging with eight inches, and you did get a plus one to determine combat resolution in the assault phase, and you did get a plus one for your sweeping advance. So the addition of a plus one to charge, I think, makes this etheric dominion much, much, much better. And it would be really interesting for people to see or talk about, or, I mean, I wonder... Uh, I mean, we don't get FAQs really frequently, so uh, we'll just have to wait and see what happens when the... Uh, mythical demon PDF full demons of the rune storm comes out but I wonder which version of this is going to happen because they've rewritten this rule already in five months and we haven't even seen the main book yet like I said the plus one to charge here makes this much better than it was before I was actually pretty harsh on heedless slaughter I didn't think it was all that great um, but because uh, I thought it was a pretty strong restriction a pretty heavy restriction and benefits that were okay 
um, especially when compared to other things. Not only do you not have many that many options in here because the PDF only uh, connects those corrupted engines to two of the Etheric Dominions, but Heed the Slaughter is just better in this one. So, awesome. Way to go. We will talk a little bit later about why that matters and how different combinations and things like that are going to come together. Um, but first, let's get on to the units. So there are four new profiles for us to talk about here and options that you can take. And there are a number of new weapons that go along with those things. Now, most of these are Forge World models that I, I don't even know if they really get play in 40k anymore. I think they might be Legends or maybe not even. I think, think some of them have even just not been discussed at all in 10th edition. So, all you old heads with these things sitting around, rejoice! Heresy is still, again, proven to be the place for you. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the Catan Demon Engine, and that is the uh, hilarious, tall, basically uh, world leader space marine that is actually a knight. Um, and that is filling in the Lord of War spot. So the Catan Demon Engine is 420 points, which is not free. Um, it has a movement 14, weapon skill 6, ballistic skill 3, strength 9, front armor uh, 13, side 12, and rear 12. It is initiative 4, attacks 4, and has 8 hull points. Now the combination here, uh, the, the composition of the unit is just one, and it has the unit tights, knight, and corrupted engine. It has arm-mounted Catan Gatling cannons, it has a cleaver of slaughter, and it has a number of special rules. Flank speed, etheric dominion, heatless slaughter, so it's specifically tied there, which all of these units are specifically tied to an etheric dominion. Hammer of wrath four, so you're getting four hammer of wrath strikes at strength nine, that's not bad. Rampage D3, malefic aegis five plus, and traitor. The malefic aegis is an invulnerable save, does not stack with other invulnerable saves, but can benefit from rules such as cyber familiar, that specifically increase existing saves. Interestingly enough, the invulnerable saves on these demon engines are better than the uh, invulnerable saves that standard demons get, which are not allowed to be taken against force weapons. I suppose there's an interesting trade-off here where while demons have the ethereal invulnerability rule, which gives them an invulnerable save that is negated by force weapons, uh, the demon engines still get to take their saves. However, Every wound is going to cause D3 wounds because of that instant death rule. So, just a comparison point to note and uh, to think about. So let's talk about the stats here and, and the, the effectiveness of this unit. So it's got a movement of 14 means that it is already getting a plus 3 bonus to its charge rolls because of its speed. When you attack on the Heedless Slaughter special rule from the Etheric Dominion, you're getting an additional plus, plus 1 so this model is moving 14 inches and then has a plus four for its charge. This means that you can effectively make up to a 12 inch charge on an eight, which is pretty nuts. A standard charge of a seven is only, only requires a three for you to hit. So this thing is going to very comfortably be able to move, uh, and very likely going to be able to move 14 and charge, um, you know, move and charge up to 21 inches without necessarily worrying too much about it. What's interesting here is that the weapon skill 6 is, I believe, better than any knight that exists. So this demon engine is the best knight melee in the game currently, which makes sense since it's possessed by the spirit of the god of battle and slaughter, but whatever. And the cleaver of slaughter is no joke. It's a strength 10, AP 2, melee, brutal 3, and shred weapon with its four attacks five on the charge i mean i don't know that you're really going to want to use a 420 point 420 point model to just try to kill like a command squad or something i suppose you could it's got eight hull points it's pretty tough weapon skill six but um oh shoot it's got rampage so interesting rules interaction here with the knight type and anything else despite the fact that you're you've got like a 12 inch tall model here on the board knights do not count as any more than one model for the purposes of outnumbering they have no variation of the bulky rule they are not like vehicles which count as 10 it is not specifically stated in their rules same with dreadnoughts they are just one model as far as outnumbering goes same with jet bikes with bikes this edition that means that this 
giant towering monstrosity has provided it's charging more than one model will always get its extra rampage attacks which is a little silly now it's not just a pretty face and a uh, really big axe it also has that sweet gatling cannon which is essentially a punisher cannon from the sakaran punisher it is a 36 inch range strength 6 a ap4 heavy 18 pinning and shell shock weapon now, admittedly, you're only Ballistic Skill 3, so you should expect to make no more than 9 of these shots connect. However, with Strength 6, you should be wounding most standard infantry on a 2+, and have a pretty good shot of having them take a wound, which means taking a pinning check at a minus 1. Now, Knights can fire weapons at different targets, um, although you only have one here, so it doesn't really matter. You can move out of combat and shoot your gun per normal. Knights do still have a requirement, though, that they must be able to charge something that they have shot at. This isn't as big of a deal with most knights because they've got multiple guns, so you just make sure you keep one gun to shoot at the target you're going to charge at. This is a problem for the Catan, except for the flank speed rule. The flank speed rule says that a model with this special rule can increase its movement by four in any movement phase, but if it does so, it can't make shooting attacks in the subsequent shooting phase. So this model could be even faster, up to an 18-inch movement. That's insane. This model still can charge in the assault phase after that move, so 18 inches plus your charge with a plus four to move. That's bonkers. In addition, when declaring a charge after making a shooting attack, a model with this special rule may charge a unit that it did not target in that turn's shooting phase, provided the target of the charge meets all the other criteria of a valid charge. You can, with the flank speed rule that the Catan has, either skip your shooting phase just to go four inches farther if you really need to close the distance, or you can shoot at something and then use your charge to charge something different. So a lot of versatility just for this model. Again, with that extra rampage, the regular four attacks plus D3s, you're going to be throwing a fair amount of damage into something. So taking this unit and throwing it into a medium-powered Death Star or something uh, and doing a lot of killing, I think it could actually be pretty effective. This is a model that I could actually see making its points back just because of its ability to move across the board. The nice combination of its weapons, all that sort of stuff. Definitely one that I would consider using if I had the spot for it. It is a Lord of War choice, but it's pretty cheap at 420 points. It has all the standard protections that a knight has. It's got a better weapon skill than usual. And because it's a single model with weapon skill 6, then even fighting against command squads or whatever, those command squads are going to be hitting back at you not as effectively as they'd want to otherwise. I rate this one very highly. The next up is the Greater Brass Scorpion, which I have to admit is one of the coolest looking models in the 40k range, um, and I'm glad that we can throw some on the board in 30k as well. So the Greater Brass Scorpion is 440 points. It is also a knight. It has movement 10, weapon skill 5, ballistic skill 4, strength 9, front side armor of 13, and a rear of 12. It has 4 initiative, 3 attacks, 8 hell points. Um, it again comes in a unit of 1, has the same subtypes, vehicle, and corrupted engine. It's got a whole bunch of guns, though, and some claws. Now, let's take a look at its war gear. It has a turret-mounted scorpion cannon, a central line mounted despoiler cannon, two hull front-mounted hellmaw cannons, two, two hellcrusher cannons, and two hellcrusher claws. I want to point out that it does not say in this entry that the uh, extra attacks for the Hellcrusher class has been included in this profile. So my assumption would be that this model has um, an additional attack coming, so a base of four before charging. It does have the special rule Heedless Slaughter, so it is getting an additional plus one to charge. It is only movement 10, so that Heedless Slaughter is going to double its charge bonus from a plus one to a plus two, which is pretty good. Now, speaking of those claws, we'll just go ahead and start with that because melee is the name of the game, isn't it, folks? Well, maybe not entirely. So the Hellcrusher claws are Strength 10, AP 2, Melee Brutal 2, and Sunder. So where uh, the Cleaver of Slaughter had Shred so you could re-roll, this one actually seems not only efficient at squishing um, little multi-wound uh, infantry, but Strength 10 with Sunder means that it's going to have a very easy time punching through the armor of even armor value 14 models. So this is pretty good. 
Um, it's got enough attacks and it's AP2. You could, I mean, you could you could hull out quite a few things, especially if you're looking at a Land Raider or a Spartan that's lost a couple of hits from something else along the way. Scorpion Cannon has range 30 inches. It is strength 5, AP4, Assault Mine, Pinning, and Shred. So the reroll on, on uh, wounds, the Shred is pretty nice because this is only a strength 5 weapon. So wounding on 3s most of the time against standard infantry or threes are better with a reroll. Pretty nice. Assault Mine and Pinning, you are losing out eight shots, or nine shots, sorry, when compared to the Gun of the Catan, but the Scorpion has a better ballistic skill, so you are going to make some of that back a little bit um, in the fact that you're hitting more regularly. A gun like this, Assault Mine, you can count on hitting six times, a count on approximately four to five wounds causing your opponent at least against uh, standard marines so definitely you can probably count on causing a pin or you can hope to cause a pin every time this thing shoots not bad at all not as effective as the shell shock before but again still pretty good now it also gets the despoiler cannon a 24 inch range strength 10 ap3 ordinance 1 blast 3 sunder rending 5 plus and brutal 3 so wow that's a lot of rules um sunder to re-roll the re-roll armor penetration on a strength 10 weapon is is really great uh brutal three is absolutely nuts considering you're putting that together with an ap3 weapon already and uh rending five up that's really really good it's a blast weapon it's ordinance so there, there's just a lot going on with this gun only a 24 inch range but on a platform this tough, you feel like you can actually get close enough to use it. Now the Helmon Cannons are template weapons, Strength 7 AP4, Assault 1s, but they have Torrent 6 inches, so you can move this around a little bit to get as many infantry as possible. What this means is that the Scorpion actually has a number of weapons that can do some pretty devastating things to infantry, both causing a lot of wounds on massed infantry, and also putting the fear into power armored infantry, or even uh, multi-wound tough infantry as well. Very effective shooting, I think. For 440 points, again, I mean, it's it's pretty it's pretty tough. It's got eight hull points. It has a five plus invulnerable save, and it still has that rampage. It still has hammer of wrath. Four. I like this one as well. It's less effective in melee combat directly against big stuff, perhaps. What's interesting about this is even though it's only weapon skill 5 as opposed to weapon skill 6, the fact that its attacks have Sunder instead of Shred uh, means that it's much more effective against vehicles um, with that chance to reroll. And so I think that the Great Brass Scorpion may be a better all-around choice if you're looking for uh, one of those demonic centerpieces for your army. Okay. Now we have two of the smaller options, and these ones uh, can actually fit into a standard force organization chart, and that's going to be important. We'll talk about those in a minute. So the one that I'm the most intrigued by, I have to admit, is the Blood Slaughterer, which is a silly name, but it's 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 still there. It's fine. Okay, so the Blood Slaughterer is a 110-point model. It occupies a fast attack choice, and you can include up to two additional Blood Slaughterers for an additional 110 points apiece. So 330 points for the max squad, three of these. Their movement is nine, their weapon skill is five, ballistic skill is three, strength and toughness of six, five wounds, three initiative, four attacks, leadership nine, and a three plus save. They are dreadnoughts, and they have the corrupted engine subtype. They have two slaughterer blades for weapons. In addition, they are also keyed to Heedless Slaughter. They have Furious Charge 1, so they, on the charge, they're going to get an additional strength. They have Hit and Run. They have a 6-plus Invulnerable save through their Malefic Aegis. They have Move Through Cover, and they're Traitor Marked, as you would expect. Now, there's only one War Gear option that changes here on these, and that is um, that you can add an Impaler Harpoon. If you do choose to swap out an Impaler Harpoon and it replaces one of the Slaughter Blades, then the model's attacks are going to be dropped from 4 to 3. However, I still think you might consider doing this on just one of your uh, models just in case. Why? Because of the Impaler gun itself. The Impaler Harpoon is only 12 inch range, but it's Strength 6 and AP 3, 
and it has it's heavy one, which doesn't matter because it's on a dreadnought, and it has the impale special rule. And impale says that a unit may re-roll charge rolls when attempting to charge a unit that has suffered one or more hits from a weapon with the impale special rules caused by one or more models in the unit for which the charge was declared. This takes effect even if no wounds are caused by the hits. If one or more wounds are caused by a weapon with the special rule, then the affected unit decreases its initiative characteristic by one until the end of the subsequent assault phase. Okay, re-rolling charges is excellent. Um, these are keyed into the Heedless Slaughter subtype, so you will be getting a plus one for your movement because of your movement nine. You're getting an additional plus one because of your Heedless Slaughter. So now you're getting a plus two to your charge. If you hit, which admittedly is only going to happen on a four plus, if you hit with that harpoon, now you get a chance to re-roll with a plus two on your charge. If you cause a wound, then the initiative of the target unit you're going after is going to drop by one. Now, why is that great? Well, the blood slaughterers are only initiative three. So you have a chance to strike simultaneously. Now, I don't know what exactly you're going to be throwing these things at because they are still toughness six with five wounds a piece. So it's not like they're going to get chopped down by a whole bunch of different things that they're worried so much necessarily about. So they're worried so much necessarily about like striking first. However, it is pretty interesting to consider. The best thing I think is the charge bonus reroll. Now let's talk about those slaughterer blades. The Slaughterer Blades are no joke. They're Strength User, AP3, with a melee rending 6+. So against anything with a 2-plus armor save, these guys are going to be a little bit hit or miss. You're going to be forcing a lot of saves, but they're not necessarily uh, going to be doing a ton of work if you're banking on those rends. However, AP3 means that these guys will absolutely chunk big squads of, let's say, Tactical Marines, blocks of Despoilers, Assault Marines, or things like that. So pretty darn good. Now last up, moving up, we're going to come back to the bl the Blood Slaughterers in a minute and why I like them so much. Um, we're going to get through all the units first. The last one on the list is the Decimator, and the Decimator is a hefty 265 points. It is one in its unit. It's Dreadnought. It has the heavy special rule, so it can't run. Um, it does have the Corrupted Engine, as of course, and it comes with two Decimator Siege Claws with inbuilt Heavy Flamers. It's special rules. This is the only one with the Etheric Dominion Malevolent Artifice. It has Hammer of Wrath 2, Furious Charge 2, Malefic Aegis 5 Plus, Move Through Cover, and Traitor. So a Decimator may exchange either of its Decimator Siege Claws for a Butcher Cannon or a Soul Burner Petard. So the Butcher Cannon is exactly as you would expect from the equivalent that we're looking at here, which is a Leviathan. It's a Strength 7, AP 4, Heavy 3, Rending 6 Plus, and Twin Linked weapon so it's good three shots 48 inch range uh you only have a ballistic skill four on this thing so the twin link is even better etc etc the soul burner is a 24 inch range strength six ap4 heavy one blast three breaching five up and flesh bane so this is kind of interesting because it's strength six but it still has a flesh bane on it whatever the point is that it's going to wound and in its small blast pretty decently um, and Flesh Bane means that you're very likely to cause some wounds. There's nothing necessarily fantastic about that, but it is, you know, it's its own thing. Now, the Decimator Siege Claw is uh, Strength User, AP2, Melee, and Brutal 3. So keep in mind that if this thing charges, it has Furious Charge 2. So you're talking about Strength 10, Brutal 3, which is very wild. It's got five attacks base. That does include the additional attack from having two weapons, which would be dropped if you do take a gun with one of these. I don't think that I would. Um, now, keep in mind the fact that because this thing has toughness 7, and when you combine that with a Malevolent Artifice, if you're trying to shoot at this with anything, Strength 6 or lower, then you're going to get to re-roll those 2 plus armor saves. So you can absolutely forget about Volkite uh, trying to chunk through one of these things. You can absolutely forget about uh, trying to tear it down with bolters or whatever. It's going to take heavy weapons to get the job done. Now, the big problem, of course, is that this is a heavy support slot. So depending on your list, that's going to be a pretty competitive sort of thing. So maybe it'll work, maybe it won't for you. But it's a pretty nice unit, and that added additional malevolent artifice is, is extra durable. So very clearly, these are designed to be used in the Mechanicum book 
and are designed to be and a way for you to begin to represent that dark mechanicum army hopefully this means we're gonna get more of this i don't know i guess i won't hold my breath because i've been holding it for a year for the rest of the demons book shout out to sean from omaha who almost had a hernia when he first read demon something being released by games workshop today and then found out it wasn't the demons of the ruined storm pdf anyway I think the important thing to realize about this release for Mechanicum is just how important it is as far as the ability to find models that actually have weapon skill 5 and include them within the range. Previous to this point, there is essentially no way to even get to match the level of a base elite melee force in the Adeptus Astartes. It was entirely shooting. Uh, models that were useful last edition for such a thing were really hamstrung by the fact that they were weapon skill for. Now, uh, Dark Mechanicum essentially has access to the best melee level uh, knight in the game, hands down, the Catan. The ability to supplement these in with some of your lists is going to be absolutely beneficial, at least if you're playing traders, um, and is really going to add a huge breadth of options to your army. I really, really like this, especially for the ability to actually have a valuable... There are melee units here, that actually have the ability to do something for Mechanicum players. That's great. But it's not just Mechanicum players who are gonna reap the benefits of this. What's interesting though, of course, is the fact that you can add additional rules onto this through the employment of the Pravian. Now, anytime you can take a unit and then just beginning to add additional templates on top of it or additional rule sets, you have the opportunity to create really strange and interesting interactions. Sometimes this sort of thing ends up broken, sometimes it ends just sort of dumb, but I just wanted to talk about some of the different ways that you can combine these concepts together based upon the Legionus Astartes and in fact also the Bound Demons PDF that we've already seen. I want to very quickly go over the traitor aligned armies, traditionally traitor armies, and how I think I might include one of these based on those Legion traits. So first off, with the Emperor's Children, getting a plus one initiative on the charge, even a disordered charge, would be very good for a lot of these units. It'd be good for the Blood Slaughterers, who already only have an initiative of three, so getting a plus one. And with the uh, Impaler, uh, Blood Slaughterer of the Emperor's Children, which hits and wounds with a, an Impaler, is going to be able to strike at an initiative four over other things which have been dropped down to initiative three. Pretty effective little ability. Honestly, striking at one faster initiative would be fine for just about any of these things. All of these units also make sense, honestly, with an Iron Warriors list. The Brass Scorpion getting a plus one to strength on all of its guns with middling strength to be able to take out um, mid-armor vehicles or dreadnoughts or the like. It's pretty nice. The fact that you can get a plus one to strike on all these various attacks against vehicles. Anything that has been striking at strength 10, striking at strength 11 is just even more likely statistically guaranteed you're getting closer to a statistical guarantee that you're going to be able to pen whatever armor you're punching and do some damage all pretty good for the blood slaughterers as well because their strength six base is good but not necessarily good enough to really feel like you've got a chance to throw enough wounds on something of a dreadnought caliber to take it down as so many of these are melee focused again the plus one attack that you're going to be gaining from using them as a world leader is particularly good, especially on the, for example, slaughterers, that plus one attack on three models in a unit, theoretically, pretty great. However, it's also very good on the super heavies who are going to be light on attacks, one additional attack at strength two, uh, AP two with brutal. Uh, it's pretty darn nice. It's going to go a nice long way. It makes sense for such early adopters of the demonic, the sons of Horus, to have a pretty good synergy with these units. Given that their legion power is a minus one to strength of attacks coming at them in the first round of close combat, um, all of these vehicles being high toughness and multi wounds or multi hull points, um, that's pretty great. That's pretty fantastic. The for the none of them are vehicles, so none of them get the auto hits. And I believe, unless someone can tell me I'm wrong, that means that uh, the minus one strength should also work for the knight variants as well. So if that's the case, then all of these are pretty darn effective. In particular, I like this for the Blood Slaughterers, though, for another reason. Um, the Blood Slaughterers, if you take them with a Paravian and you put them into a standard uh, force organization chart, they count as fast attack choices. Now, one of the things you're really wanting to do 
uh, with one of the rights of war the Sons of Horus has, the Black Reaving. I think I've talked about it before when I was uh, posting my commentary on the Inducti, which I will link below. But essentially, the Sons of Horus have one right of war called the Black Reaving, which incentivizes uh, taking Reavers as troop choices and giving them a line, but they're special elite units. Um, th the other thing about that right of war is that it encourages you to take many small units together because if you charge the same enemy unit with more than one unit, then the second unit that charges gets Rage 2, which is two different attacks. So not only do you want to have lots of units that are charging, um, but you want to have, you know, those high weapon skill units. Now, the Inducti synergize well with this because they have a rule that incentivizes them to charge while within six inches of a Sons of Horus unit that has high weapon skill. And on top of that, the Black Reaving requires fast attack choices, and this fills that spot. One thing that's a real negative or a real downer about this is the Black Reaving already has an HQ tax of a Master of Signals, so now you're adding an additional HQ of a Prabian to this just to bring this extra unit, and the Prabian really won't fit in a lot of other places depending on how you're building this, um, but it is sort of an interesting idea or option. The other thing that's really interesting, and one of the ideas that I had when it first came out, and again, hopefully something that uh, GW will clean up whenever they release the actual Demons of the Ruined Storm PDF, Kabanda actually has two profiles right now. One, which is what came out with him when his model first popped, and then the next, uh, which is his bound Kabanda rule for being summoned onto the board. He has different rules. They've, they vary in a couple different ways, one of which is the fact that he um, has access to two different etheric dominions, depending on which version of him you take. So let's say you do take the, um, the Heedless Slaughter is what is attached to him if you take him as Bound Kabanda. And Bound Kabanda, if he is the, the Warlord of your force, and he is allowed to take the Warlord of your force, even if he is not part of the primary detachment of your force, then he gives all units within 12 inches of him, that is all units with the Heedless Slaughter Etheric Domain, um, at Rage 3. So they get three additional attacks. So if you just think about that, that means that the Blood Slaughterers on the charge have eight attacks a model, seven if you have one of them with an Impaler, um, which is a lot of attacks. Now, if you instead take him as his standard Kabanda rules, he has a different rule altogether. First off, it's not tied to his Warlord trait, um, but instead, within 12 inches, all models gain plus one to their Rage and plus one to their Rampage, which is interesting then because it goes on to note that this affects the Crimson Fury Etheric Domain, which as far as we know doesn't exist anymore or never existed because the full rulebook has not come out. So anyway, this is complicated. The point is that if you use this right of war and you bring Kabanda and you also bring either the Inducti or you bring the special blood slaughterers, uh, depending on how you build it, um, you can grant and buff those models accordingly. You can't do both though, because depending on the profile that you choose, it affects either one or the other. I like the idea of bringing Kabanda in an allied detachment of bound demons and then using them to supplement the Heedless Slaughter for the Blood Slaughterers. I think that's pretty fun. But the problem is going to be that not only are you playing all sorts of shenanigans with organizing your Force Lord chart to make that happen, but on top of that, you have to satisfy the requirements of summoning because you need to have Psychers who can summon Kabanda, which means probably Esoterists. You also need, of course, to buy a Pravian so that you can include this demon unit in your army. Will it happen all the time? No. Could it happen once or twice and be a really cool way of getting more demons on the board, at least until GW finally just gives us the free PDF that they quote have been just putting finishing touches on since like January? Yeah, it's definitely kind of a cool option. Humorously enough, I think that the Alpha Legion also have kind of an interesting argument to make for the inclusion of one of these models. The ability to be considered two inches farther away as far as charges or declared powers or things like that is, is pretty great. Especially considering that these models are going to have a natural vulnerability to psychic powers. Many psychic powers are pretty short range. So by increasing that distance of two inches away, if your opponents smart up and start bringing librarians or other esoterists to try to take you down, this is going to help you out a little bit. Also, it's going to help you because that extra two inches of distance, if you are not able to make the charge like you wanted to the first turn, or if you just know it's not quite going to be 
uh, quite right. You can, you know, for example, depending on what you're going against, uh, put yourself at just about the right range to make a guaranteed charge for next turn while being pretty confident that the additional two inches that you are creating in that space isn't going to be as easy for your opponent to bridge as opposed to what you're able to do. Sadly, I don't think the Night Lords, the Death Guard, the Thousand Sons, or uh, even honestly the Word Bearers have a lot going for them when including these things. The Word Bearers have like maybe the best argument for that plus one uh, to wound resolution, depending, but that's really not nearly as powerful or potent as other things. Not as good as I'd like it to be, considering, um, you know, word bearers definitely are the ones that should be including these things. I think that if I were a word bearer player, I might do it anyway, just because, like I said, it's, it's what the lore demands. There are also some loyalist legions that have interesting rules combinations, and honestly, a couple of them that it actually kind of makes sense to consider, depending on the narrative you're playing, what time period you're playing, in the heresy, or maybe you're doing alt heresy, that sort of thing. In particular, I think it's fun to think about using Dark Angels for this. I know that's like the, the go-to got em. Uh, You know what really annoys me? I've said this before. Do you know what legions have, Loyalist legions have cool traitor only warlord traits? The White Scars do. The Iron Hands do. Do you know who doesn't? The freaking Dark Angels. That really makes me mad. Anyway, so Dark Angels, the ability to add a Hexagrammaton to one of these guys. Um, pretty great option in a couple of situations, uh, especially considering the fact that there are a couple of rights of war that you can take with the Dark Angels that get benefits depending upon the mark that you include with them. So you're not going to get anything for using the Stormwing mark because it specifically attaches to bolters. And unless you get a friend who's willing to let you get a point on the argument about blades for the Deathwing, you're not going to be able to get a plus one to hit, although that would be so sick. I'd let it happen. But anyway, some of the other options are still pretty interesting. Considering the high level of toughness on a lot of these models, giving Dreadwing subtypes so that Flame, Plasma, Volkite, and Phosphex weapons have a minus one strength coming towards them, and then all poisoned weapons need a plus one better to wound. I guess plus one worse to wound than before. That's not bad, especially if you were considering combining it, for example, with the Eschaton Imperative Rite of War. Not only would you be getting that additional toughness coming towards you, but anyone who is inside dangerous terrain, you're getting a plus one to wound. Also, these models would be ignoring dangerous terrain themselves as they scuttle through things. Not bad. Adding the Ravenwing only gets you a plus one to run, which is kind of underwhelming in a lot of situations. But Ironwing and Firewing don't look so bad to me. Firewing itself is not necessarily that great. A plus one to wound when attacking a unit that contains at least one model with an independent character special rule. Now, if there are some other, like, shenanigans going on with the wound differential or whatever, this could come in handy. But it also ends up being pretty neat, for example, if you end up taking it alongside something like the Serpent's Bane Rite of War. Serpent's Bane is the one where you declare three priority targets, and anyone who has at least one model in its unit with the Firewing subtype gets a plus one to hit against those units, which means that if you're going to use these, uh, like for example, Blood Slaughterers, to specifically charge after one of those targeted units, having a plus one to hit and a plus one to wound if there happens to be an independent character in there, sounds not so bad itself either. Iron Wing itself, re-rolling ones to hit against vehicles or dreadnoughts isn't bad at all either, um, less so for something like the Blood Slaughterers, but pretty great for the big knights if you're going up against um, dreadnoughts or if you're going to have to use them to chunk down like a super heavy tank or a big transport to try to get at the soft little bits inside. Also, again, like I said, I think it's pretty cool to consider the Caliban Dark Angels for sure are summoning demons by the time the end of things goes around. So there's no reason to say that they couldn't have some demon engines around. The other big option, of course, is Iron Hands, um, especially considering, I mean, th these are already very durable, but the ability to have a reduction of shooting attacks coming towards them of one for strength is just absolutely nuts. They would be really strong as well. And I guess in the lore there are there are traitor iron hands, so it makes sense to consider that if that's something you've done for yourself in the lore, or as I know some people are doing, if you're interested in any of the alt heresy sort of stuff. 
Now, in addition to this, I think it's important, I just want to stress again, that if you are trying to combine a Legionus Astartes list, putting one of these units in, and then combining it with Kabanda, for example, uh, you're going to be getting a plus three to attacks. This, however, will only specifically work with the Blood Slaughterers, because Kabanda is already a Lord of War, and so you cannot take any of the super heavies um, and the decimator is does not have the right etheric dominion so it doesn't work but it is a unique combination which i think could be fun if that's something you're already leaning towards building well that about wraps up my summary i think i've gone over everything what do you think about this pdf are you excited about it please let me know and uh, let me know if you want to see more demon content going forward as i said this is also going to be included on the next episode of the ineptus astartes podcast but I'm just putting it out early today so people can get a look at it, start thinking about it if they're interested. Uh, please don't forget to like and subscribe. Consider dropping a tip in the bucket. Really appreciate all of your support and um, talk to you soon.